would introduce Seema Chadari and also Ed Seward. Uh, Ed, you will have all met before. Um, he's uh, Mr. Fit, aren't you, Ed? Everything Fit, and um, has led the work um, in NCL from uh, the secondary care perspective and uh, has also uh, beat the drum for Fit in terms of the national gastroenterology um, uh, dialogue across all our um, different trusts um, around how we should be using it and has published quite a bit on FIT. So uh, thank you very much. So, OK, I'm going to pass over to to both of you to take us forward and uh, please raise your hand. You've got a question um, and I'll um, depending on what you're asking, we'll um, bring you in or not, depending on where we are with the with the slides, but we'll try and address everything and make some um, time for questions at the end. Thank you very much. Both of you, Seema and Ed, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, can we get the slides up, please? Is that possible? Yes. Uh, hi, Ed. So, um, yeah, I'll be uh, sharing my screen for the slides. Um, just for anyone who doesn't know me, um, my name's Seema. I'm uh, one of the Sarit GPs working with the NCL Cancer Alliance um, on their FIT strategy. Just bear with me while I uh, get the screen up. Please let me know if everyone can see the, the slides. That's great. I think we can see them. Thank you, Seema. Oh, slightly excitingly, I can't. Oh, OK. Um, I'll send them across to you. Which isn't a disaster, because I can just go off my presentation. Yeah, but I um, think that's absolutely fine, Ed, and I'll send them along as they are. Is that OK by everyone? Yeah, I so it, we, we project them. Can everybody see them? Yeah. Yes, I yeah. can. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. So, um, Ed, I've sent them again as an email to you, but they are mostly your slides anyway. So, yeah. OK, great. Well, if um, I should come through, it's, to it's always a joy of Microsoft Teams, is it? It never fails to surprise you. You know, it doesn't matter how used to it you think you are, it can always catch you out. So, um, uh, so uh, apologies uh, if I if I talk to a wrong slide. Um, I was just going to bring up the what's in the session slide which should be the second one so that's it um, that's up yeah brill so thank you so um i just thought i would i know everyone knows everything about fit now i i completely get that uh, i just thought i would try and update things uh a bit just to talk about some more national experience um specifically with respect to nottingham in terms of the importance of using fit uh, in terms of better outcomes for our patients. And then we'll talk about the guidelines that have been adopted by the Royal College of GPs uh, based on the BSG and, and colorectal surgery. Okay, so um, next slide, please. Um, so I know you all know this, uh, obviously no, nobody ever uses FOB anymore, it's all fit. Uh, and what I tell my patients is it's very important just to counsel them uh, to don't let the poo hit the water in the bowl. So uh, I know you sometimes we have poo catches or I just tell them to put a load of uh, toilet paper in the bowl just to try and catch the poo. Uh, and the lab scientists always tell us not to overload the picker because that can um, screw up the machine's analysis of, of uh, faecal globin. Uh, and then the other thing is it takes seven days to reach the lab. It's pretty stable uh, in the cassette. So uh, a patient doesn't have to dash the sample in. Although I don't know anyone who has poo in a pot in their house for any longer than it has to be. So um, generally people are pretty keen to offload it, but if, if they can't for whatever reason, uh, they shouldn't panic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm beginning to get patients coming through who've done a fit at home and I, and I googled this and if you google or go into Amazon and, and have a look for fit tests at home you can pay between about eight and 80 quid um, 
I probably don't need to tell you that there's no guarantee on these at all. So probably like a lot of tests that you can buy from uh, from Google or Amazon or whatever it is a bit rubbish. So um, if you have patients pitching up who've done a fit themselves, then tell them it's they wasted their money and uh, just get them to do a proper lab one because um, the uh, analyzers are not um, okayed by the uh, sort of officials um, in, in that respect. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just to remind people, but 99% of this talk is going to be on using FIT in symptomatic patients, but of course we do use FIT in bowel cancer screening patients. And um, just to remind people that the, the FIT level at which you get a colonoscopy if you live in England is 120, which is obviously way higher than the FIT level you get uh, you get two week wait referral on if you're uh, symptomatic. So don't get any reassurance really from if your patients come up to see you and they've done a bowel cancer screening fit. The um, there's there's plenty of data on this. They knowingly miss half the cancers that are out there, uh, and that's not because they're cruel and wicked. Uh, it's because obviously there's no money to support a um, uh, a uh, a bowel cancer screening service using a more sensitive fit. Um, it makes us an international outlier, uh, unfortunately. Uh, Scotland is next worst at 80, uh, and then most of Europe is about 20, uh, is the level that they choose. Oh, I've just got the screen, uh, just got the slides, brilliant. Um, so, so that's, um, so don't get any reassurance at all. If your patient has a negative fit, uh, if they've got symptoms, uh, they need to get a two week wait. Uh, Come in. Test. I spoke with him already. Oh, I wanted to turn in. Yeah. Um, okay. Next slide, please. If you've taken your call externally uh -huh. to our call, can you go on mute, please? That would be great. Thanks. And then he said that his sugar Dr. J. is Raja. trying to keep. Yeah, Dr. hello. Hi, can you go on mute because we can hear your other conversation? Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Sorry, Ed. Off you go. That's right. Um, so uh, the data when it initially came out uh, was uh, was great. It, it suggested that there was 100% negative predictive value for a fit below threshold. Uh, and of course, you never believe anything which is 100% accurate. Um, but that was quite exciting data, which then prompted more research. Uh, next slide, please. And it, statistically, if you look at FITS comparison against symptoms, symptoms are rubbish. And, and if you think about it for a second, the whole two week wait program is based on only a 3% positive predictive value for symptoms for cancer. So 97% of the time your patient wasn't going to have cancer. And so symptoms inherently are always going to be rubbish. And this this graph just shows you the difference. And, and the, the line in red is, is FIT versus uh, the blue line, which is uh, symptoms, high risk symptoms. And in essence, uh, you could flip a coin uh, with more accuracy, to be honest. Um, symptoms generally are rubbish. Clearly, they're, it's why the patient is presenting. So it's what we have to go off. But fit is much, much, much better, both in terms of sensitivity and specificity than symptoms. So we're going to go on to some local data now, and I apologise, this is a really busy slide, but I just want to draw a few points out of it, really. Um, so point number one, um, so this was a trial of three and a, three and a half thousand people on the two-week wait pathway who had a fit and either a colonoscopy or a CTC. So they had a definitive colonic diagnosis. And we found that a uh, if if your fit was below threshold, if it was below 10, uh, you had a 99.5% chance of not having bowel cancer, which is obviously great. Uh, and that should reassure us all. Um, about 80% of patients were fit below threshold. Uh, again, that's great. So that's 80% fewer colonoscopies we need to do, which is brilliant for cash strapped uh, NHS. Um, this meant that cancer pickup rates, if we went solely on fit, uh, would go from two and a half percent, which is what they were based on on symptoms, to 9.7 percent, call it 10 percent, on um, using fit. 
So you, you really concentrate your cancer diagnoses into the fit positive group, uh, which is very helpful. And then the final thing to, to note is that the higher your fit, the greater your risk of having bowel cancer. So if you have a fit greater than 80, uh, your risk of bowel cancer is about 20%. And uh, this isn't shown on this slide, but a fit of 40 would actually probably only give you uh, um, a risk of bowel cancer of about 3%. So, so it does make a big difference. So, And that can be quite helpful, particularly if you have very elderly patients uh, who don't want um, to be referred up for investigation. And I find it quite helpful having a, being able to have a conversation with an elderly patient to say, actually, your fit is really high, uh, you know, um, maybe we should even just do a, a plain CT just to look for cancer. Of note, one in six of our cancers, 15% of our cancers were, were fit less than 10, but half of them had iron deficiency anemia. So in our data, uh, combining a haemoglobin with fit was really helpful because if your patient had iron deficiency anemia, it meant you could disregard the fit and investigate them anyway because that will reduce your uh, false negative rate. Um, next slide, please. Um, the biggest study of FIT uh, in the UK is something called the NICE FIT study, and that was 10,000 patients from South London in and around Croydon. And they found um, actually no loss of fidelity with iron deficiency anemia, so they didn't show what we had showed, but otherwise the data was very similar. Um, their data was slightly more reassuring for the negative predictive value of, um, of FIT. They had fewer false negatives than we did. Um, but the important thing is they're all going in the same direction, uh, all these studies. FIT's really good, really sensitive, and avoids a lot of needless uh, colonoscopy. Uh, what about FIT and polyps? That's on the, the next slide. Uh, again, this is our uh, North Central London data. And in essence, it just shows that it fits pretty rubbish for detecting polyps. So it's great for cancer, but uh, we can't reassure our patients they don't have polyps. Um, and some people are a bit worried about this because of all this colonoscopy we were doing. Um, we were also opportunistically picking up polyps and removing them and therefore avoiding the risk of bowel cancer further on down the line. So. So there is an argument that if we rely completely on FIT and do less colonoscopy, then then maybe that might have deleterious effects further on down the line. But my own personal feeling is it's better to concentrate our resources uh, where we can. And, uh, you know, the message still stands that FIT negative patients don't need colonoscopy. So I'll just summarise uh, on the next slide. So the negative predictive value of uh, a fit below threshold is really high. And actually uh, in the latest NICE uh, uh, guidance, uh, they quote a 99.8% chance of you not having cancer if your fit's less than 10. So a really high negative predictive value. And the vast majority of patients who we screen with colorectal symptoms will be negative for fit, which is great. Uh, the higher your fit is, the greater the risk of serious pathology, so that's worth bearing in mind, um, and fit's not helpful for polyps. And the point they make nowadays is that if a husband and wife come into your uh, surgery and let's say the wife is the one with the symptoms, doing a colonoscopy if she's fit negative, you might as well colonoscope her husband as well, because having a negative fit gives you a bowel cancer risk the same as that of the background population risk, about 0.2%. So it's, it really makes no logical sense to scope people with a fit less than 10. Uh, that's a sort of message. So that's that. Um, I wanted to talk about Nottingham now. So Nottingham were the first area in England um, that really ran with fit. And um, they had two studies, getting fit in 2016 and keeping fit in 2017. And that tells you everything you need to know about the appalling puns that always come with um, uh, with like paper titles for uh, on fit. 
and they found that uh, again they use different thresholds so they had less than four four to twenty twenty to 100 greater than 100 so so a lot of this is uh, not directly applicable to how we use fit but anyway the point is is that they found a very low false negative rate uh, uh, along with us so that's great uh, next patient uh, next slide please and and this is quite an important slide so let me just walk you through it looking at those three blue boxes uh, at the bottom of the slide so on the left hand side we it was the case that we were diagnosing half our bowel cancers on the two week wait uh, pathway and the other half were on the 18 week wait pathway so patients were referred in with tummy ache or whatever and then by using fit what they found is that uh, and this is a right hand blue box 88% of their cancers were being diagnosed on the two week wait pathway and only 12% were being uh, diagnosed on other routes in, uh, which is an amazing shift if you think about it, because you're concentrating all your bowel cancers onto the high priority, you know, well looked after, well monitored uh, cancer pathway. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, and these aren't my slides, I'm afraid. I, I pinched them from Iron Banerjee in, in Nottingham. Um, but in the bottom left, you'll see it's got stages of bowel cancer. And over 55% were stage one and two cancers that they were diagnosing. And apparently this represents a shift, uh, an improvement in um, stages of bowel cancer that they were diagnosing. Because because they were diagnosing them all pretty much on the two weight pathway, they were diagnosing them earlier. GPs had a lower threshold to use FIT. They were finding these patients, they were sending them up and um, bam, patients were being diagnosed at an earlier stage, which is clearly why we're all here, is to try and improve the, uh, if you're going to have bowel cancer, you might as well have it at a, an earlier stage. Uh, that little green box is just to point out that a second FIT was really good at um, ruling out uh, uh, bowel cancer in, in previously fit negative patients. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So this is really just to summarize. So, so what they saw in Nottingham by promoting fit and, and getting primary care to utilize fit is that they saw a switch of cancers away from the routine pathway towards the urgent pathway. Um, they actually did demonstrate a benefit of going down to, to fit greater than four rather than fit greater than 10 in terms of increasing the sensitivity of the test. Uh, but that's not going to happen because NICE have, have decreed it's going to be 10, which is fine. Um, they also demonstrated there was some benefit in terms of being able to pick up previously fit negative cancers with a repeat fit test. And, and outlined in red there, they possibly found, you know, the holy grail of cancer diagnostics. They potentially demonstrated that by using fit we're shifting our patients to a more treatable cancer stage. So that's all very encouraging. So um, just to bring you right up to date. So um, next slide, please. So the BSG and the Association of Coloproctology uh, brought out a joint set of guidelines. Uh, and this is a sort of summary um, flow diagram that's in the guidelines. And it basically tells you what what we do now. So um, you have a patient with symptoms, you do a fit test, and if the fit's greater than 10, you send them up on an urgent pathway. And if it's not greater than 10, then you um, safety net them and you either re reassure them, tell them there's nothing there to worry about, or you refer on a uh, pathway to, to get their symptoms checked out. And on the next slide, and again, I apologize, it's um, it's a little bit um, uh, wordy this, but it's probably worthwhile going through because these are often points that come up. So it addressed if your patient doesn't do a fit, and I know this is a real pain, um, but then it just says, well, you just use your common sense, you know, and if you think they've got high risk symptoms and you can't get a fit out of them, then you refer them up, which I think is fair enough, but do everything you can to try and persuade your patients to do the fit because it's a really useful uh, triage test. Uh, with respect to safety netting, 
uh, they said uh, you, you need to be able to do safety netting. I'm going to talk about safety netting a little bit later. And if your patient's got a fit below threshold uh, and they have ongoing symptoms, then you should refer up for to secondary care for evaluation. And again, we're going to be talking about the fit less than path fit less than ten pathway in a second. Um, it says you can use fit uh, for people with iron deficiency anemia. And that's what the overall guidance shows. Uh, as I say, our local data suggested that if they've got iron deficiency anemia, just refer them up. But the pooled meta-analysis data says that actually iron deficiency anemia probably isn't that big a deal. But in any case, if they've got iron deficiency anemia, you're going to have to look at their top end anyway. So I think definitely refer them up. And uh, interesting one this, we suggest referral of patients with persistent or recurrent anorectal bleeding for a flexi-sig, even if their fit's less than 10. So that's worth thinking about. And then uh, we suggest that fit may be used to stratify adult patients aged younger than 50 with bowel symptoms suspicious of a diagnosis of bowel cancer. And this is an interesting uh, bugbear of mine and it'll be interesting to talk about if if we get a chance uh, after the talk because um uh so the youngest person i've seen uh referred on a two-week weight pathway with a positive fit well it was 17 as of a few weeks ago it was 16. you know and uh, i i struggle to be supporting the use of fits in such young patients uh, to be honest. And so so I think it's really important we that we take away that bowel symptoms suspicious of a diagnosis of bowel cancer. And clearly if the 16 year old's got blood in their poo, way, way, way more likely is going to be something like, well, other than hemorrhoids, you know, things like um, uh, proptitis. So then the calprotectin is probably going to be arguably a lot more helpful. So, um, but young patients, I know lo lots of people have lots of difficulty with, so we'll try and talk about that if we can. Um, there are no specific Royal College of GP guidelines that I could find, but I could find a document which basically uh, rehashed the BSG ACP ones. And this was the take home messages uh, from that article. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, um, uh, you know, it is possible to have fit negative cancer, so so do consider referral if you've got ongoing symptoms. Um, it reassures you that fit can be used in the presence of PR bleeding. Um, it doesn't tell you anything about the upper GI tract, so if you have an anemic patient, you should still refer up uh, for consideration of uh, examination of the upper GI tract. And um, it reminds you that sc the screening fit uh, the threshold is much higher than for symptomatic patients, so it's 120 rather than 10. So don't be falsely reassured by a uh, a negative bowel cancer screening fit. OK, so those are the guidelines, and, and I think probably most people's practice is, I'm sure, broadly in line. So on the next slide, uh, and this is this date is a year old, so I apologise for that. I've, I've not seen any up to date. Um, Seam, uh, data. Seam, can you go forward one more slide? Thanks. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, yeah. apologies. I'm um, my I'm really out of sync with the slide. So so yeah, just shout at me if I'm doing it wrong. Um, so this oh, yeah. is that OK. <laughs> um, so this is just data looking at uh, across the four uh, hospitals on the NCL patch. Um, so uh, about one in six, 16% of referrals were fit less than 10. Um, and so, but we've got a separate pathway for those that we'll be talking about in a sec. Um, about 40% were referred up with no fit at all. And I, I would hope that figure is lower now. Um, I say this is, this data is a year old now, but um, uh, because of the value of fit and particularly with the experience in Nottingham, seeing that sh stage shift of cancer, I think it's beholden on us all to try and use fit as much as possible. Um, and uh, and then just a point that we're doing a lot of colonoscopy in either people with a fit less than 10 or with no fit at all. So it's just the sort of reminder that in terms of NHS resources, 
you know, we're better channeling that into um, the patients that we're really worried about. So the ones with the positive fix. So, um, so that's, so it's, it's just seeking to get as good compliance as is possible uh, with use of fit. Uh, and then you'll be aware that uh, we are um, looking at this uh, in NCL and uh, we're on to a, a phased program and we're apparently we're on phase three now, I think, or possibly phase four. Uh, I lose track. Uh, and in essence, one of the things that we've done is we've offered a fit less than 10 pathway. And the purpose of that pathway is to um, is really to try and collect a bit of data in terms of how good um, what makes an effective way of uh, managing these patients. Um, and what we're looking at is we're, we repeat the haemoglobin and we repeat the fit test. And the reason we're doing that is to try and generate some data as to whether that's a helpful way of picking up um, the fit negative cancers. Uh, and you'll be aware that um, fit less than 10 referrals can now be downgraded uh, onto a routine pathway. And so if you guys are sending up fit less than 10s on the two week wait pathway, then you'll be being called by the two week wait team and you'll be told actually your patient's going to go on to this fit less than 10 pathway. This, they get to see a senior clinical decision maker, which at UTLH is a colorectal SPR, a senior of colorectal SPR, and then they decide what to do with them. Next. Um, yep. Um, yep. And uh, great. And I'm going to present some data. Uh, some it's currently unpublished data from Oxford about the relative uh, effectiveness of their pathway. But that's what we're doing in in uh, NCL at the moment. Now, uh, next slide, please. Um, so the um, the data, this actually, this data came along after we'd already decided to do a repeat fit because we thought it made sense. And it's always nice when data comes along which confirms that what you thought made sense does actually make sense. And what they were able to demonstrate, this is data from uh, Preston and uh, 28,000 patients who had two sets of fits uh, in symptomatic patients, 19,000 of them um, had two negative fits and the risk then of subsequent colorectal cancer if you have two negative fits was only 0.04 percent. Now you'll remember earlier I was quoting you a 0.2 percent risk uh, with one negative fit. So two negative fits you get a logarithmic benefit basically so that's quite impressive and there's other data from Scotland which seems to support the kind of this kind of direction of travel. So uh, I would encourage you to use the Fit Less Than 10 pathway because that allows us to capture the data. But if in the future you you did happen to be safety netting your patients, then then I am sure a repeat fit will form part of that safety netting because um, the benefit is there basically. OK, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is this is slightly cheeky of me. This was um, a paper I was asked to review, so it's not been published yet. Um, but it's data from Oxford. There's a chap called Brian Nicholson, who's an associate professor up there. He's a GP. Um, and this is his group's data. Uh, and this was 600 patients. And they followed them up for a couple of years. And they were able to demonstrate that um, the patients that they safety netted, um, only a relatively small number, about one in six required endoscopies and about one in five needed scans. And they only had one colorectal cancer that they discharged back to the GP. So that's one from uh, 600 odd. I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure I believe this data. I can't believe you can have 70 year olds with, um, you know, a large proportion of which were anemic or had weight loss and not investigate them. I mean, it seems remarkable to me. But anyway, there you go. That That's what the data says. Um, so it's likely that safety netting in any in any case you know safety netting has to exist somehow and and we're trying to collect data to to compare to oxford and and, and see where we are but definitely a, a repeat 
full blood count and repeat fit seem to make sense to me. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. You will all be aware that NICE have just okayed uh, what we do. So um, although I sat on the NICE panel myself, so of course they would agree with <laughs> what we've been doing, but um, everyone else agreed too, so that was nice. So um, so we're we're now fully NICE compliant. Uh, so that's uh, so that's good. But I don't think NICE has said anything too controversial. Although I'd be interested to hear if anyone in the audience thinks it is controversial, and we can perhaps talk about it. So my basically my final slide is the next one, which is really just to talk about fit controversies, and these are just sort of common questions I get asked about fit, uh, and I could sort of run through them quickly. Um, hopefully you know it already works in rectal bleeding uh, and you just have to counsel your patients to um, to either test a non-bloody stool or test a bit of poo away from the blood. Um, does it work in iron deficiency anemia? Uh, that, that answer is slightly controversial. Uh, I would say it's less good, um, so I'd have a low threat, uh, but I would certainly refer them anyway because because we need to have a look at the top end of their bowel. What threshold to use? So that's been confirmed by NICE. We're going to use 10. And that's when you, you hear me talk about rather than a positive fit and a negative fit, I talk about a fit below threshold or a fit above threshold. We're not meant to say positive and negative fit, uh, but I keep on forgetting. But you're meant to, because the threshold will probably vary in the future as more data comes out. Do you need to investigate the upper GI tract in a patient with a positive fit? No, you do not. Uh, that I, we can be quite definitive about that for the time being. Uh, what do you do about safety netting? Well, as I say, we've got a fit less than 10 uh, pathway available and please, please, please use it because the more patients you put down there, the more data we'll get to know if our safety netting works or not. What do you do about young people? I say I think this is really hard. So we're trying to do a study in NCL where we do what's called a lab can do reflex testing. So if somebody goes in with a positive fit and they're young, say they're under 40, then the lab can automatically test for a calprotectin. And then if that calprotectin is high, then we recommend a referral down an urgent suspected IBD pathway rather than the cancer pathway. And I think that makes more sense. I think it's better for patients because we're telling them we think you have IB, IBD, not we think you could have cancer. And uh, and they still get the tests that they need, which will be a colonoscopy. Um, so that would be my advice until we get that running, is that if you have a very young person, you know, a person under 40 who's got abdominal symptoms. I mean, if you want to test for a fit, test for a fit by all means, but please test for a calprotectin as well, because that's going to be statistically the more likely diagnosis. And then finally, uh, what to, to do about people who don't return fits? Well, hopefully I've addressed that. Uh, you just investigate them anyway, um, but it's not ideal and really twist their arm if you can, please. That would be appreciated. Good. I think they're all my slides, Seema. Great. That's, that's really helpful. And thanks for putting your um, email up there as a the last slide. Um, uh, and of course, you can contact us as well. Um, uh, I think most of you um, have our addresses, but I'll, we'll put something in the in the chat as well. But edward.seawood1 at nhs.net. So thanks very much, Ed. Um, so I, I kind of like to open it to questions. And there are, there are some that have been posted. Um, Ed, can you uh, ask, we've covered it, but if you could just reiterate it. The question came from Tara, how often is it worth repeating fit with new symptoms on a background of previously negative fit? Yeah, so um, I think if it's the same, so there's definitely a value in doing it twice. I probably wouldn't do it more than twice, to be honest, because then you then I think you just might as well refer them up. If you're thinking about doing a third fit, then I would just refer them up on a routine pathway and say, look, this guy's got two negative fits. Uh, I know from the present data, his risk of colorectal cancer is 0.04%, but I'm still worried. And then that's completely fine. Um, and then, do you know what? Almost definitely that patient will have a colonoscopy. And I think that's okay. Um, yeah. 
repeating a fit endlessly is you're you're wasting your time i mean it doesn't cost a lot they're sort of five or ten quid a pop fit so they're not very expensive so you won't break the bank but you will it's a bit pointless really so so yeah and and then sometimes people ask about the timing of when to do a second fit and nobody knows the answer to that and uh there's some people who've done it within a week or two and we were proposing doing it after about eight weeks um but i think it's um i think the the jury's out on that one yeah but the most important thing isn't it that um if you're not sure you reassess the patient first so you see them you meet them face to face yeah. you might um you certainly do an examination you might want to redo their bloods you might want to trend their bloods because their bloods may appear to be normal but in fact if you trend them you'll see that they're trending in a, in a negative direction so all those things are clinically really important and helpful for the team if you're going to refer up and of course if none of that was happening you might decide to look after the patient yourself and not do anything further depending on what was going on um I think that's the really important thing to remember. And then there's an, we've got another question, which is moving to calprotectin, Ed. Um, what would the cutoff in age be for the lab adding on calprotectin? So that's when they add so on that, themselves. Yeah, so that's to be decided. Uh, I would favour less than 40. Um, I think if I saw a patient with belly symptoms, you know, over 40 is when uh, colorectal cancer begins to creep into my differential. So I would, uh, so I would do a fit in an over 40 year old. But I, I personally, and every time we have this discussion, um, often people mention, you know, but I had a 28 year old who was diagnosed with bowel cancer, and of course, all of that is true. Uh, and the youngest patient I've ever seen with bowel cancer was 14. So you can get it at crazy ages, but clearly it's incredibly unrare. Uh, it's incredibly uh, unlikely. So I would um, I would say 40 for, for calprotectin, but that's in, per in terms of the study, that's to be determined. But it will be if it's not 40, it will be 45 or, or something like that, but probably 40. Thank you. And Rachel's put in a question. Rachel, would you like to speak your question or do you want me to read it out? But if you'd like to speak, it'd be great to hear. So you might want to put a bit of context around that question. Go on, Rachel. Hi. I think we can hear you. Hi. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Not at all. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I find um, I work in the obviously in a two week wait. And we find a lot of our um, anemia is a very broad heading, but with microcytic anemia, would you say that should be more streamlined out of the lower GI pathway? Because we do find there's a lot that comes in that could possibly find a nesting home. Uh, I don't know if, if from the upper GI service rather than the lower GIs. I don't know if any other um, pathways are finding that streamlining in much more on their pathway that's interesting uh, do you know, yeah i think that's a really interesting question and i've not thought about that that's the first time i've heard anyone propose that but you're right if you if you believe so so as i say the pool data the meta-analysis data is is that iron deficiency anemia doesn't make any difference with your risk of having a, a, a fit below threshold cancer so um so you're right if you've got a negative fit and your hemoglobin is 94 with an mcv of you know 68 mm -hmm. then um then it should be an upper gi referral and they should just do an endoscopy because our local data demonstrated a higher rate of false negatives in um in fit less than tens i'm still a bit nervous it, i'll be honest if it was me triaging it I would still do a colonoscopy yeah. Yeah. and I, I know that's against uh, nobody said to my knowledge that um, you definitely do not need to do a colonoscopy in somebody who's mm -hmm. fit below threshold with iron deficiency anemia nobody's said that you know they're leaving it up for I guess individual clinicians and my own feeling is I would still do a colonoscopy but 
Sure. I uh, I accept your logic entirely. You're right. If we follow it to it, its conclusion, they should be investigated just on the upper GI pathway. Yep. Do you do you think part of uh, if you think about our population and who we're um, who comes to um, hospitals in our part of the geography, either NCL for us or NEL for Rachel? Um, the other causes, genetic causes and all and dietary causes and all sorts of other causes of microcytic anemia um, may um, that I wonder whether that those sorts of things were taken into account when they looked at the data on that, because that would change the clinical picture a little bit or it might change the interpretation. That's that's true. And I suspect you can argue it either way. Yeah. And um we're lucky in NCL and NEL is that we've got local data. Yes. You know, if you lived in Birmingham, then you just have to go off the meta-analysis. Yeah. Because we live in North London, uh, or we work in North London, um, I can I can say that, you know, with absolute confidence that in our population, uh, you should investigate the lower joint tract as well. But yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Yes, yeah. So we're not changing anything at the moment. So Rachel, I guess it will stay where it is at the moment, but it's certainly something that we might talk about or at BSG, I could imagine it would become a interesting yeah. just debate. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, now, other questions. I'm, I've got some people posting in the chat and some people posting in Q&A. So please yell if I've missed a question. Um, I think we're OK at the moment. One or two things that I wanted just to mention while people think of a few more questions is that we've seen I've seen a pickup um, in or an increase. I don't know why in spoiled samples. And when I've tracked them back um, in NCL, they've come from the what's the, their samples that the patient has attended reception in general practice for a fits kit to go to take home to use and have been given a universal container so rather than thanks very much Seema rather than the one with the green picker that you can see on the screen now um, and I think the only explanation is that there's quite a, there may be a lot of churn in staff at the front desk or it's possible and not everybody may be um, completely aware of of what test is required, what um, test kit is required, although, you know, we, we believe there should be, but they might not be. So um, it would be really helpful if you could mention to your um, practice managers that we are, we have seen a few cases like this. And we know that because I've, we've, you know, spoken to patients and practice, we've tracked it back. And we know that the kit was handed over um, or the incorrect kit in the situation was handed over at reception. So if you could remind um, uh, people in reception that, and have some way of making sure there's repetitive reminders so that people, um, uh, the staff there, do give the right um, sample kit out. Um, it's a, a thing that I've seen. It's growing over the last three months. I'm not really quite sure why, but I, I think it's just that the more time passes, the more staff change. Um, so it's just one of the things to, to to be careful of. Have also found it happening in in some of our hospitals uh, again. So it's individuals. Uh, so um, it does happen both sides of the coin. But it's just important to re keep repeating the story, um, and that would be really helpful for your support with that. Um, Nicola, you've asked a question that I think has been answered. Are you happy with the answer? You've written about how long would one wait before repeating a fit? And I think you're, yep, yeah, you're happy. Okay, good. Uh, um, the other thing I wanted to draw people's attention to um, and stop me if I'm repeating it um, unnecessarily is that it's just to remember that at the moment we're in a in-service pilot in NCL. So the first pro, the first pro, um, guidelines that we would have published on the pathway, which um, required GPs to hold fit less than ten patients within their um, within practice and continue to safety net them. We'd like, if possible, 
absolutely everybody that you do that you get a fit less than 10 on to be referred into this fit less than 10 pathway which is running for 12 to 18 months in total it may run to 24 months in the end um, so that we can follow them and include them in the study that we're doing um, which is based around um, it's an, it's essentially, as I said, it's an in-service audit and look and tracking at what happens to patients with fit less than ten. So I just wanted to repeat that because I know that obviously, uh, particularly in patients where clinicians feel the risk is very, very low, um, we know that clinicians report back to us that um, in certain cases they're feeling that they would just like to uh, um, finish complete the safe deck themselves and not send that patient in. Um, and I can completely understand, we all do, the motivations around that. It's just that we're trying to get the numbers up of the patients who have been proven to have a fit less than 10 so that we can put them through the fit less than 10 pathway and gather the data and track them. So um, anyone who falls into that fit less than 10 bucket, please send them along. Are you happy with that, Ed? Do you want any other yeah, qualifying? Absolutely. So that's, that's mean, the kind of chain. It's, it's this, we're doing it in the interim. And when we look at the data in the end, we'll then come to a view on what we'll do in the long term. But that won't be for another um, six to 12 months. Yeah. Okay. Uh, have, have you seen? Yeah, sorry. Just, just want to make sure you, you, you don't miss the question about visible bleeding. Did you pick that oh, one? Yeah. Thank you. No, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's just coming to the chat, is it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Dr. In, in the Q&A. Yes. Q Chat, yeah. so that's impressive um <laughs> thank you um so is there anything you uh, want to say about the fit the finish we've interrupted you ed about fit less than 10 or can we go to this question oh no 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 that's fine so fit less than 10 i guess if your patient's symptoms disappear i mean don't feel you have to refer an asymptomatic patient in who's fit less than 10 and there's no clinical concern but ongoing symptoms fit less than 10 yes if you can send them to us that would be brilliant because we can it's all about understanding how safe it is um, and again we're we're generating data for our local populations which is then really helpful because that really informs uh, future practice for your for your patients so yeah thanks Claire thank you okay so moving to our question about visible bleeding from hemorrhoids do you want to take that shall I read out the whole question or have can you see it uh, I, I can certainly see it. So, yeah. so yeah, the question is, um, if somebody has visible bleeding, for example, hemorrhoids, do you wait for them to stop to check a fit or does it disc discriminate between these? So um, I think the in the Royal College of GP guidelines, they seem to suggest that a fit will discriminate between fresh blood and altered blood. But that's not the case. It's a it's a antibody against globin. And globin is globin is globin. It doesn't matter how fresh it is. So, um, so if you dunk the fit picker into uh, a pool of hemorrhoidal blood on somebody's poo, uh, surprise, surprise, it's going to come back as positive. So, so in all, so I would definitely say to my patient, okay, you've got PR bleeding. You can, and this is what I say in clinic. You can either wait until you stop bleeding and then sample the poo, or you can uh sample the non-bloody end of the stool you know if it's obvious because often people just get bleeding right at the very end um so that's what i say to my patients claire would you agree yeah no absolutely absolutely yeah um and then a follow-up question from fazana if someone has an upper gi bleed then will a fit test pick up altered blood in the stool so we've kind of had the uh we it, um, we've really had the answer, but you can talk about it if you want, Ed. Yeah, so it shouldn't do. Um, I mean, I was just saying uh, to Seema before we went online, There's there's been a really interesting American study looking at um, patients who have a positive fit, who, who then go on and have a colonoscopy, and a colonoscopy is normal. So in that group of patients, and they had, I can't remember how many it was, but it was tens of thousands of patients, they that group actually did have a higher rate of upper GI cancer than than patients uh, than the normal patients. So in other words, the suggestion is that some blood does get through 
the small bowel in a, I guess, an undigested form to then register as positive on your fit test. That's the suggestion. But all the teaching up till now has been if your fit is negative, uh, sorry, if fit will only pick up a lower GI bleeding source because globin is digested by the gut. So in answer to the question, if you're having an upper GI bleed, will you have a positive fit? The party line is no, it will be negative because the, hemo the, the globin will be digested by your gut. But there's some interesting preliminary data and it's not reached guidelines or anything like that, but there's some interesting preliminary data that possibly it could do. But party line, no, don't do a fit if you're thinking of an upper GI source, it's a waste of time. Thank you. Great. Um, what we I, we've got just three minutes more. So unless I've missed another question, I think we should probably um, come to a close so that you can make your next um, appointments. But I want to say thank you very much for attending. Thanks so much for Seema and to Ed for all that you're doing. And thanks to all of you for helping us um, explore and continue to explore um, FIT's use in our population and uh, being a, a la using FIT to allow us to concentrate the right patients, the highest risk patients in the right pathway is definitely going to um, give us more and more benefits. And as you saw when Ed was talking about the data, um, we should be able to deliver us a shift in stage, um, we hope, with pickup, which is extraordinary. So thank you very much. Any questions you want to um, ask further, do contact us and we'll come back to you. Or you can put it in the chat and we'll pick up the question and, and the Q&A and we'll pick up the questions and, and get them get them out to you. OK. Thank Great. you very Thanks much. Thank you. Thanks both of you very much. Thanks.